Every, well, sometimes it's Wednesday, sometimes it's Thursday morning, uh, I have the best meeting of the week. And it's the week in which you feel like a benign version of, of Stalin. That's the morning, <laughs> the morning when Bob Mankoff, the cartoon editor, comes in after he's pared down somewhat the stack of cartoons that comes in every week called Roughs, Rough Drafts. And I get to choose with, with Bob helping me at my, my left elbow. It's, it's easily the best time of the week, and sometimes being the editor of The New Yorker means determining what to do about this John Updike review or that Adam Gopnik piece. Much easier, but much trickier in many ways, is choosing which talking dog cartoon, which drunks at the bar cartoon. But the real master of this, and we've been working together now for 10 years, is Bob Mankoff, who himself is a superb cartoonist, uh, you may know him from his classic cartoon where the guy's on the phone, classic business cartoon, guy's on the telephone, and he says, um, what is it, Bob? How does it go? No, Thursday's out. Oh, Thursday's out has, is never good for you. Bob has sold that on, the, on more shower curtains and posters and coffee cups than you can shake a stick at if that's your idea of a good time. Bob Mankoff is my idea of a good time. Please welcome him. Thank you, thank you. Uh, you can also get that cartoon as a tattoo. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm really, I am absolutely uh, delighted to be here, and of course a little nervous, because I mean, I looked at that schedule. I mean, the people on it, and the ideas, the foresight, the insight, the hindsight involved, and, and I said, well, gee, uh, plus you're dropping two grand. I said, is it going to be worth it? But then, you know what I did? I divided, the, you get 23 lectures, divided by 2,000. It's only 86 bucks. <laughs> uh, so I think, I think you're going to have a good time. And, and, and if you're not satisfied, uh, I actually, David, will refund the money. <laughs> On the other hand, if you really like it, this is a tip jar. <laughs> so, ah, let's start. Well. The past, present, and future of cartoons. I said humor, but I pared it down a little bit. And, but the thing is, for 86, whatever it is, you're going to get 100% satisfaction guaranteed. Uh, actually, I'm taking that down to 75%. <laughs> because here's what actually 100% satisfaction in humor looks like. <laughs> You really don't want to be 100% satisfied. The last person, <laughs> the last person who was 100% satisfied in New York was Elliot Spitzer. <laughs> but although we tend, we tend to think of humor as really this very positive emotion, you know, it's the best medicine. Although I'd say if you got cancer, go with the chemo. Uh, <laughs> it hasn't always been the case. In fact, humor has been viewed very, very negatively. Uh, Plato, Aristotle, Hobbes, just look at this stuff. This is very, very gloomy stuff. They basically viewed humor as a type of deformity uh, that doesn't engage our empathy and therefore we take pleasure in. Uh, another three great philosophers of the 20th century pretty much summed up their view. This is basically the superiority theory of humor. Now, would these guys have thought this is funny or if I made fun of them, thought this is funny? Well, really, they couldn't because they didn't have a sense of humor. It was impossible for them to have a sense of humor because the whole concept of a sense of humor wasn't really uh, invented uh, until uh, the 18th and 19th century by the British philosophers who, who, who had all sorts of a sense of beauty, a moral sense, uh, and also a sense of the ridiculous. And it was very different because for those philosophers, what, what it was where where for these guys, humor resided in the, in the object. The object was clearly ridiculous and deformed. It was funny. The sense of humor actually meant for the, the British philosophers and the moral sentiments that it resided in us, in our appreciation of incongruity. Uh, but as late as the 1870s, this guy George Vesey writes a book, and he's even worse than Plato and Aristotle. He wants to eliminate humor entirely. 
he feels that it's a horrible distortion of the human face. It doesn't make any sense at all. And the only reason we have it, the only reason we have it, is because we tickle children. We teach them this bizarre reflex. And of course, it often leads in death. <laughs> well, so when you see this, their idea would be, you should see this. And truly, I mean, humor can be uh, uh, somewhat dangerous. It can cause shortness of breath, nausea, incontinence. And if anything I do in the following slides causes uh, an erection that lasts more than four hours, <laughs> see your doctor, especially if you're a woman. Now, going back to the, going, connecting this to the New Yorker, when the New Yorker comes out in 1925, uh, let's look at some of the cartoons. You, uh, not dangerous, not too dangerous, and rather staid. Uh, the man who marries my daughter will win a prize. Well, I must say, that's awfully sporting of you. That's it. I don't think we're really going into dangerous territory there. Now, of course, over the years, the New Yorker invents really all, all, all the comic tropes, but still, the, the humor that appears in The New Yorker is, uh, I wouldn't say dangerous. I think it's funny. Let's look at some examples. Careful, these plates are extremely dirty. <laughs> and never ever think outside the box. <laughs> so that's the cartoons that appear in the page, but danger always lurks. Danger does lurk, and it always lurks, where do you expect, in the young. The young cartoonists, they come in, especially males who haven't had their libidinal energies, uh, you know, uh, channeled into the sanctioned mayhem of sports. <laughs> and yes, we have women cartoonists and, uh, uh, and straight cartoonists and gay cartoonists and Latino cart... No, that's not true. But in the near future, we will. <laughs> but anyway, what they would have us put in the, car in the magazine are cartoons like this. Clearly, we cannot do that. We're too dangerous, but maybe we will in the near future. So, of course, we have to reject those cartoons. And rejection is mainly, is mainly what we do. Now, I look at a thousand cartoons a week, and I do pare them down for David, and then we go into this meeting. And here, actually, you also have Jacob Lewis, who, who uh, was the managing editor and now is uh, uh, over at Puff portfolio doing uh, really great work in the Department of Pagination. <laughs> but we're actually not alone. We are not alone at this meeting because with us are the ghosts of former editors. They're right there, and, and should one of those cartoons come up, they make sounds. And if something like this comes up, <laughs> William Shawn himself, the ghost, will post a danger sign to stop it. When I'm preparing for the meeting, uh, of course, I mean, I'm kidding around, but I try to look at the, at the cartoons, uh, uh, at a thousand cartoons, and put them into what I call basically four different quadrants. And what they have to do is really whether, what's doing the work, the picture uh, or the words, and how do they come together. The first quadrant is basically your verbal cartoon. You would know what that image was from. My normal law office hours are over, Mr. Hodel, but I always have time and a half for you. Okay, you understand that? You wouldn't even need the picture. In, in this quadrant, which basically forms your basic gag uh, uh, diagonal, we've completely child-proofed our home. You have to be able to understand the whole picture. Here's what I call the fantasy quadrant, where you have both strange words and strange pictures. If you're silly, you crazy bastard, how are you? <laughs> hey, we got 20 minutes, stop laughing. <laughs> and here is a slice of life, so this is where the magic happens. One of the things I try to look at it is not sort of confuse the quadrants, not try to judge one area really by another. And what's happened here, and this I'll talk about a little bit, where cartoons go in the future, eventually a whole sort of comic cast of characters, almost a Lego set has been created, and this is why you can create a thousand cartoons a week. Also, the way people view the cartoons and actually process them perceptually is very different. You're going to see a video movie of that cartoon, which is basically verbal, you'll see both eyes as they scan this cartoon. It's basically verbal, they look at the verbal cartoon, 
and they go right there. Now we're going to look really at this cartoon, in which they have to integrate much more information. So they take in a lot more. It's more clearly, and here I'm going to show you another slide, which I think also has an area. <laughs> Stop laughing! We got 10 minutes. <laughs> this this dot is not only going to show eye movement; it's going to show pupil size, and pupil size is is related to interest. So at the moment when the cartoon is actually perceived and understood, and the different frames of reference come together, that's when pupil size is greatest. So watch. And now it increases, and that's where the cartoon people understood the cartoon. Here is his pupil size related to how much people like the cartoon. In cartoons that really like, at the moment that they put these different frames to reference, the different scripts which which clash are one, and when they get the cartoon, their pupil size increases as much as the flash bulb. This is actually you're actually looking into the brain through the eyes. So at that moment. That's what happened. Now, what people like and what people get, and 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 how they appreciate humor.、Uh, people talk about a sense of humor. A sense of humor is really three things: it's appreciation. What do you like? It's production. Are you funny? And it's the whole coping mechanism: how you look at life and can you handle life through humor. But now I'm just going to really talk about about appreciation and the personality characteristics beside, behind what we appreciate. Humor basically goes along this continuum. What we perceive to be completely normal or logical is not funny, and it moves across this thing of playful incongruity, playing with different things that go together. And if it gets too incongruous, we don't understand it. So, this cartoon, for many people, wouldn't be as funny as the other cartoons because it becomes too close to normal for them. This cartoon is still within the range of reality. You know, Thursday's out. How about never is never good for you? It's, there's an incongruity. The incongruity is that the two scripts that are coming together are one of politeness and rudeness. That's why the syntax is one of politeness and the message is rude. But it still could happen. Here you have the ringing in your ears. I think I can help. <laughs> Much more absurd is something that couldn't happen. David often says this couldn't happen, and I say you're right. And then, as you move further across incongruity, you get a cartoon like this: the three certainties: death, taxes, Bobo. <laughs> Now, that's sometimes a little bit more incongruous for people, a little bit harder to get. What does it mean? What type of humor you like is actually related to many other things about you. <coughs> For instance, people who are more conservative and like more conservative things in art le- like humor that's less incongruous.、Uh, this cartoon would be liked much more by、uh, Democrats than Republicans. The basic、uh, engine of humor is by association, and this is all humor, which means that we're going to bring together two things from two different frames of reference that normally don't go together. But here, do go together through the mechanism of by association associating two different things: French Army knife, <laughs> Einstein in bed. To you, it was fast. So, so although the reason I use cartoons is because it shows the mechanism most starkly, but whether you're writing and whether it's satire, there are always going to be two frames of reference that they're bringing together. Now, when it's sort of called a cognitive synergy, it's almost like a, an illusion. These things coming together, but the difference between humor and art is that the one thing must always diminish, must lessen the other.、It、means that. When you start out with the script, no Thursday, it, it looks like it's going to be politeness. It looks like it's caring. It looks like it's solicitous, and then it turns out to be rude. If there's a cartoon with a doctor saying, "You'll be awake during the entire operation," the anesthesiologist is on vacation. <laughs> <laughs> so diminishment is always necessary for humor, and I would categorically say that that you can't have humor. Now it doesn't have to be aggression. 
It can simply be making something more trivial, more mundane, more ordinary. So where, where the philosopher's wrong is it definitely does not have to be aggression. Sometimes it can just be diminishing logic itself through humor. So here, you have art. You have art. And here, you have humor. You have sort of this diminishment. Art also always partakes of a cognitive synergy. It's always two things. It's paint on a canvas, but paint becomes elevated. It becomes a beautiful picture. So humor is always, is always going to have uh, uh, that characteristic. The other thing to understand about humor is that it occurs in a play frame. The play frame is very different than the purposeful frame. Things that normally would bother us, be disgusting, repulsive, and aversive in the frame of play are in fact fun. And we like high excitement. We share this frame with other species, especially the primates. Starting. Okay, this is a, a daddy chimp playing peekaboo, basically, with his son. <laughs> That's the play face in chimpanzees. They also have a form of laughter. The, the essential factor of humor is going on here, which is the duality of what looks like some type of aggression in a frame of fun. So that's that. Here, you're going to basically watch this kid, and everything you have to know about humor, you're going to see here. It's a social phenomenon. The cognitive part is non-serious uh, incongruity. The emotion is mirth, and the expression is laughter. Here we go. <laughs> Okay, everything you have to know, that's the best joke he ever heard, and it is a joke, because he's violating what he knows is object constancy. It's terrible, but it doesn't matter. He's not destroying it. He's doing something bad within a play frame. The other thing is humor is a very, very strong emotion. And if it gets ratcheted enough, enough, you don't really need much of a joke, you just need a transition. Okay, watch this guy. Going up on the roller coaster. So the, so the excitement is so great in the transition, and often that's actually the structure of a joke. To make it a little bit more formal, we go between two modes. And psychologists call it paratelic and telic, which is purposeful and playful. In a, in a purposeful mode, we like to be relaxed. As the arousal increases, we feel anxiety. The, absolute, the opposite is true in the humor frame or any play frame. There, we want excitement. And we're bored when arousal is low and we want to be excited. I'm going to illustrate this with a series of pictures that I think will tell you all about it. That's a tiger in a cage. That's entertainment. It's exciting, but we're safe. Exciting, but we're safe. Just like the guy on the roller coaster. He's in danger, but he's safe at the same time. Bringing together these two things by associating them. Tiger in a cage, great. Cage without a tiger, not so good, right? Boring. Tiger out of a cage, very bad. <laughs> so for us, when we're in the humor frame, the play frame, we can experience high levels of things that normally would disturb us. <laughs> Cruel things, horrible things, we enjoy them. We enjoy them in the play frame. But. But if it, it starts to go somewhere else where it's not play for us or gives these associations, then we might not think it's funny. Or especially in a social situation, you often get laughs involved with this with this, ha ha, ooh. <laughs> One of the play frames that we've created, and I'll sort of sum up here and sort of where I think humor is going, is that the New Yorker cartoons uh, come out of a certain tradition where essentially we've created a kit of characters and situations in which people can join in and make jokes. No, no uh, where more clear is that than in the caption contest where we put this incongruous picture on the back and thousands of people uh, submit their entries. So I wrote a computer program, for instance, in this 7,133 people entered here. Okay. I break it down, just we look at all of them into the most common phrases. 
And that's the comic landscape. But what it shows is that people really want to participate, that humor is a very, very widespread ability in the population. The, the, the way people, this was the winner. Wait, would we still be doing this with the sky warrant falling? Quack means quack. And so this is why you cross the road. <laughs> But one of the things that this demonstrates is there are no wrong answers or wrong answers to vote for. This is your choice. And that's what the internet is. And one of the things that, I'm, that we'll be doing in the near future is making the caption contest itself more interactive, where you'll be able to look up all your entries, you'll be able to email your entries and say, wasn't Bob Mankoff, David Remnick stupid not to pick mine? Uh, but something that I think is going to happen that's more collaborative and I think in some ways more interesting is to give people a chance really to do their own cartoons. Here I've created a cartoon toolkit with various characters on a desert island. So I'm going to be able, you're going to be able in the near future to make your own jokes. So I see the internet as really this collaborative space where you're going to give people the tools to engage in this play frame that they love so much. And so this would be, this would be, this would be an example of it. And let me close with, a, or almost close with something I've created for this particular thing from that. We're saved, we're saved. <laughs> Not now, maybe in the near future. <laughs> anyway, I hope I'm ending with this slide. I hope I've given you something to think about. Thank you very much. Four, three, two, one.